The Economy of Nazi Germany. Let's talk about it, but first hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell so you stay educated on how your money works. For today's generation, Hitler is the most hated man in history, and his regime, the Nazi party, the archetype of political evil. This view does not extend to his economic policies, however. Far from it. They are embraced by governments all around the world. Many have even praised Hitler's economy. But in doing so, they discover the hazards of praising Keynesian policies in the wrong context. Many have even said that Hitler's economic policies cannot be divorced from his policies of anti-Semitism, racism, and genocide. Analyzing his actions through any other lens severely misses the point. But the same could be said about all forms of central planning. It's wrong to attempt to examine the economic policies of any Leviathan state apart from the political violence that characterizes all central planning, whether in Germany, the Soviet Union, or even the United States. The controversy highlights the ways in which the connection between violence and central planning is still not understood. The tendency of economists to admire Hitler's economic program is a case in point. So let's talk about the economy of Nazi Germany. In the 1930s, Hitler was widely viewed as just another protectionist central planner who recognized the supposed failure of the free market and the need for nationally guided economic development. Proto-Kinsian socialist economist Joan Robinson wrote that Hitler found a cure against unemployment before Keynes was finished explaining it. So what were these economic policies of the Nazi party? Hitler suspended the gold standard, embarked on huge public works programs like the Autobahn, protected industry from foreign competition, expanded credit, instituted job programs, bullied the private sector on prices and production decisions, vastly expanded the military, enforced capital controls, instituted family planning, penalized smoking, brought about national health care and unemployment insurance, imposed educational standards, and eventually ran huge deficits. Does that sound familiar? The Nazi interventionist program was essential to the regime's rejection of the market economy and its embrace of socialism in one country. Such programs remain widely praised today, even given their failures. They are features of every capitalist democracy. Keynes himself admired the Nazi economic program, writing in the foreword to the German edition to the general theory. The theory of output as a whole, which is what the following book purports to provide, is much more easily adapted to the conditions of a totalitarian state than in the theory of production and distribution of a given output produced under the conditions of free competition and a large measure of laissez-faire. To many, Keynes' comment may be a shock, but it didn't come out of the blue. Nazi economists rejected laissez-faire and admired Keynes, even foreshadowing him in many ways. It was a mutual admiration as many Keynesians also admired Hitler. Even as late as 1962, American economist Paul Samuelson had implicit praise for Hitler. History reminds us that even in the worst days of the Great Depression, there was never a shortage of experts to warn against all curative public actions. Had this council prevailed here, as it did in the pre-Hitler Germany, the existence of our form of government could be at stake. No modern government will make that mistake again. On one level, this is not surprising. Hitler instituted a new deal for Germany, different from FDR and Mussolini only in the details. And it worked only on paper in the sense that the GDP figures from the era reflected a growth path. Unemployment stayed low because of Hitler, though he intervened in labor markets never attempted to boost wages beyond their market level. But underneath it all, grave distortions were taking place just as it occurs in any non-market economy. They may boost GDP in the short run, but they do not work in the long run. To write of Hitler and Nazi Germany without the context of the millions of innocents brutally murdered and the tens of millions who died fighting against him is an insult to all of their memories. But being cavalier about the moral implications of economic policies is a stock in trade of the profession. When economists call for boosting aggregate demand, they don't spell out what that really means. It means forcibly overriding the voluntary decisions of consumers and savers, violating their private rights and their freedom of association in order to realize the national government's economic ambitions. Even if such programs work in some technical economic sense, they should be rejected on grounds that they are incompatible with liberty. So it is with protectionism. It was a major ambition of Hitler's economic program to expand the borders of Germany to make it economically viable, which meant building huge protectionist barriers to imports. The goal was to make Germany a self-sufficient producer so it did not have to risk foreign influence and would not have the fate of its economy bound up with the ongoings in other countries. It was a classic case of economically counterproductive xenophobia. And yet even in the US today, protectionist policies are making a tragic comeback. Just look at Trump's protectionist policies and isolationist views. These policies are being combined with attempts to stimulate supply and demand through large-scale military expenditure foreign policy adventurism, welfare deficits, and the promotion of nationalist fervor. 
Such policies can create the illusion of growing prosperity, but the reality is that they divert scarce resources away from productive employment. Perhaps the worst part of these policies is that they are inconceivable without a leviathan state, exactly as Keynes said. A government big enough and powerful enough to manipulate aggregate demand is big and powerful enough to violate people's civil liberties and attack their rights in every other way. Keynesian, or you could say Nazi policies, unleash the sword of the state on the whole population. Central planning and freedom are incompatible. Hitler, like FDR and many world leaders today, left their marks on Germany and the world by smashing the taboos against central planning and making big government a seemingly permanent feature of Western economies. So what are your thoughts? How did Hitler's economy influence the US economy today, if it did at all? Leave a comment down below and let's get a discussion started. And as always, take care of your money.